Welcome to the 11 Warriors show for Friday, August 2nd, 2024. I'm Jason Priestess. That's Chris Lauterbach, and that's Dan Hope, special guest joining us. Oh, yeah. For this one, uh, Dan spent yesterday at OSU's uh, first day at camp and, and it has some really good observations we're going to get into in a second. But uh, got to start with our dude, Deshaun Foster, man, off the rip because uh, we made fun of him a little bit last week for the uh, cringeworthy um, introductory statement at Big Ten Media Days. The UCLA coach uh, got up there and did the opposite of killing it. One of the things he said was, we're in L.A., which is awesome. Like, no one knew that. We're in L.A., um... It's us and uh, USC. And showed up at camp, the first day at camp, he had a Nike UCLA shirt on that said, we're in LA. And just his quote on there. And I think that's just a great way to kind of lean into that, have a little fun with it. I mean, what else can you do at that point? Not a talkative guy, it doesn't seem like. So I guess he's going to let his t-shirt do the talking. Yeah, no, you got you to have fun with it. I mean, did you guys know that USC is in LA too? I found that out actually when he gave his speech. Yeah, that was really good. Funny stuff. But yeah, lean into it, have fun. Uh, but Dan, you were at camp yesterday. First time getting to see the team uh, since spring, basically. And Ryan Day raved about the quarterbacks. What did you see from the five? Uh, I mean, personally, what I saw was pretty similar to what I saw from the spring, which, you know, when it comes to Will Howard, I still want to see more. I mean, I, I have not seen him get to a point where I've gone to a practice and he's just looked great. I think that uh, he looked better in some regards than he did in the spring. But the the downfield accuracy continues to be a big question for me with Will Howard is I really have not seen him throw a great ball beyond 15 yards. And I'm not trying to be a hater here, but I'm just speaking the truth that, you know, you think about where Ohio State was a couple years ago of C.J. Stroud, and it's just hard to envision based on what we've seen with Will Howard so far that he's going to get to that level. Now, that doesn't mean that he can't be a successful starting quarterback for a really talented Ohio State football team, but I I still think there's a long way to go there for him as a passer if, if this offense is going to reach its full potential. And I think he's still got to, you know, lock down that starting job too. I think Devin Brown had a solid first day, nothing that really jumped off a page, but I think he was maybe the most consistent of the quarterbacks. You know, Julian saying you see the flashes, but you also see the freshman mistakes. Like I think he had probably the best throw of day one. He had a, a dart over the middle, fretted it between a couple defenders to G Scott. It went for a long game. But he also had several fumbled snaps. So you, you kind of see this is a guy who's going to be really, really good, but maybe not this year. You know, I think Lincoln Keenholz had his ups and downs. I thought Aaron Nolan had a pretty good first day at camp. I think compared to what we saw from him in the spring, you definitely saw some progress there with him. But, you know, he's still at the back of that order in terms of reps. So, you know, in terms of where the competition lies at this point, you know, I think, you know, Will Howard's still in that pole position. I think Devin Brown's the guy that's it's right on his heels. You know, at least from my vantage point, you know, is we're going to be, be at a few more of these practices here in the next few days. I want to see, you know, c- c- will we see growth from Will Howard? Will he get progressively better at each day? Because I think he needs to, at least if I'm going to feel really good about what he's going to be as Ohio State's quarterback. No, it makes sense. Would you say he's still the, it sounds like you're saying, I don't want to make sure though, he's still the heavy favorite to start the opener? I think he's the favorite. I mean, I don't know if I want to necessarily go heavy favorite, but I still think it's his job to lose. I mean, you don't bring in a guy who's started the better part of four seasons at Kansas State to you know come in and be your backup quarterback. If they felt like they, you know, if they really felt like Devin Brown was going to be the guy, they probably wouldn't have gone to the transfer portal and brought in a Will Howard. And so I still think it's his job to lose, but you know, it's also his job to win. Like I think he's still got to go out there and win it. And you can't do that in one day. I mean, even if he had been great on day one, you know, there's, you, you got to show it over the course of practices. So it, it never is going to come down to just one day, but you know, I, I still think like there's progress that needs to be made from him over the next few weeks. Otherwise you're going to wonder, well, is this just what he is? Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It, and I know Dace spoke about his body, his, his, his composition, and how some of that had changed. How did he and uh, Brown look running the ball from the quarterback spot? 
Yeah, they, they did do quite a bit of that on, on day one of practice. And they, they both look comfortable in that regard, which, you know, I think that's a definite plus if, you know, if you're looking for positives here compared to, you know, Kyle McCord last year, CJ Stroud before that. I, I think these guys are much more comfortable taking off, running with the ball, you know, finding their spots where they do need to make a play with their legs. And so I think regardless of who the quarterback is, because really all of these guys have that ability, I think regardless who a quarterback is this year, we're going to see a more of a quarterback run component than we've seen the last few years. Nice. Turning our attention to the wide receivers, uh, that's someone else or another group, I should say, that you guys kind of highlighted in, in your, uh, your practice report. Uh, you know, day raved about Carnell Tate. You guys said, you know, he'd look like maybe as good as any player on the field on uh, Thursday. What specifically flashed for him? Yeah, I think, you know, Carnell Tate, there was a couple of plays and there was one in particular I can think of. Uh, Will Howard threw the ball to the sideline. It was a little bit high and, and he just kind of, you know, leaped up, made a grab over a DB on the sideline. And I think just, you know, that that was really kind of accurate of what we saw from him all day. That He was, you know, making a lot of plays. You know, you're going up against some really good DBs in Ohio State practice. And, and I thought, you know, for the better part of a day, he looked like the best player on the field. And so I think, you know, the things we've heard about Carnell Tate, Going back to last year, I, I think day one was kind of a good reminder of like, oh, yeah, like this guy's going to be really good, too, because there's been so much hype around Jeremiah Smith, who also looked really good on day one. But I think Carnell and I think Brandon Ennis as well, I, I think both of those guys had a really good first day where it's like it, it's not just Jeremiah. There are several young receivers on this team to be really excited about. And Carnell Tate, certainly one of them. That's fun to hear. The conventional wisdom might be that, you know, Ibuka, uh, Tate, and Smith are the first three guys out there when, when Ohio State runs three wide receiver sets. Do you feel that, or do you think Ennis can make a play and, and get in there? I do think it's likely those three that are the starters because, I mean, we've, we've heard the way they've talked about Carnell Tate. I mean, this is a guy who Marvin Harrison Jr. said last year that he was – Fervor ahead of where Marvin was going into his sophomore year. That's that's pretty high praise for a guy. And then, I mean, Jeremiah, he, he's just, you know, I, my our colleague Andy Anders made the comment today. He just makes everything look easy out there. And this is a guy who's a true freshman. So I just think his potential is so high. If he's not starting on day one, he, 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 what are you doing? Like, he's just too good not to be in that lineup right away. And so I think, you know, those two are very much on their way towards starting spots alongside of Mecca Buka. But I still think Brandon Ennis is going to play a lot. Like, I, I think there's going to be a rotation there with all four of those guys. I think they're going to move a Mecca around, have him play outside some with Brandon playing in that slot. And I, I think Brandon's a guy who can be a real asset for them. And so, you know, I, I think you know, I don't necessarily expect on a regular basis that the rotation is going to go beyond those four, assuming those four are healthy. But I think we're going to see a healthy dose of all four of those guys. Yeah, it's an interesting point for sure. Yeah, I think in the past, you know, we've talked about wanting to run six wide receivers and, and be, you know, be super deep. But it's been top heavy for many years now, I think, where some of those guys that maybe are fifth and sixth in the rotation just don't see much. And uh, I could definitely see that being the case this year where it's the top three and then Ennis is kind of nipping at their heels when you talk about playing time. And then after that, maybe it's a little bit more of a drop off, especially when you talk about meaningful snaps, meaningful games kind of thing. But but we will see what Ennis can ultimately do. But thinking of some other position battles, uh, flipping to the other side of the field, um, obviously Sonny Styles. it was you know, some news today. You, you guys had, um, you know, our news yesterday. I talked about how Sonny was out there with the ones uh, ahead of Hicks at the weak side spot. Um, a lot of fans obviously, or, you know, there's a lot of Sonny fans and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of CJ Hicks fans too. Um, and we've not really seen either one of them in this position uh, at this particular spot very much. What should we make of anything of Sonny running with the ones on the first day of camp? Or is it too early to, to say that Sonny's the guy? What's your, what's your take on that battle? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, by the end of a weekend, I might have a better answer on that after seeing, you know, how these first few practices play out. If, if Sonny's out there with the first team, alongside the other 10 starters every day, then he's probably the front runner. You know, CJ's out there, you know, taking all the first team reps on day two or day three, then, you know, that would just show that it's still very much a competition. So, you know, you always have to be careful about reading too much into one day, but it, it was striking to me that, you know, when they had, you know, basically that first team unit together, it seemed like it was almost always sunny out there. You would have thought maybe it would be a little bit more mixed. And they were doing, you know, basically split field 
uh, drills in day one with split teams. So, you know, they weren't going to put both Sonny and CJ on the same team because they want to give both those guys a lot of reps. So that had something to do with it. But nevertheless, you know, nothing's ever by accident, right? So the fact that it's got the nod, at least on day one, to get those first reps there as the starting will linebacker, it means something. It doesn't mean, oh, he's locked up starting job, but it means something that they gave him that nod over CJ. Even if one or the other does lock up a starting nod, do you, do you envision a split, a kind of an even split of reps kind of scenario based on matchups or things like that? Or do you, do you think if a guy seizes a spot, he's going to maybe see 80 plus percent of the snaps? Yeah, it's a good question because so far in the Jim Knowles era, we've seen that he likes to kind of play the same guys there at that yeah. linebacker position. But I, I think this is a little bit of a unique situation because I do think that, you know, both these guys you know, bring a ton of upside to the table. They're, they're both, you know, going into their junior year, these guys were five-star recruits in their class. So at this point in you, your, their careers, you expect both these guys to be playing major roles. And I think there's also so many different things you can do with Sonny because he does have that background playing safety where, you know, maybe we see more four free looks this year with Sonny kind of having that ability to kind of be that hybrid linebacker safety type. You know, both of those guys, Back in high school were guys who, you know, rushed off the edge quite a bit, too. So they're both guys. Maybe we see some packages where, you know, one of them is coming in as kind of an extra edge rusher. So I think there's so many different things you can do with those guys. You, you would think if, if you're Jim Knowles, if you're James Laurinaitis, you're going to be scheming up some different ways to use those guys than maybe you were using a steel chambers at that position last year, just because these guys are, are such spectacular athletes. Right, right. And, and to that point, I feel like whoever ultimately is in that spot, you, you feel, feel like, like okay, okay, the defense is not gonna it's not gonna suffer greatly. That's for you know, that seems like a safe bet. It's just how elite can that you know, the play out of that position be. Switching over to offense though at another position battle where I think maybe it could be more detrimental if someone really doesn't seize the day is that right guard spot. So I know Hensman wasn't out there yesterday. Um and uh, it sounded like Day was talking up Tegra a little bit and you know, he's another guy he's talked about kind of changing his body and, and looking more of the part this year. It's also maybe some some you know rumblings that he had some other opportunities potentially outside of Columbus to consider over the you know over the off season. Um, what, what do you make it at right tackle now? Is is Hensman that guy even though he wasn't there yesterday? Or just and if you do think Hensman is the guy, is there any concern of having basically both of your centers starting at you know starting at the same time? Um, just you know, what do you think of that interior on the right side? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of have to see, you know, again, with that one, kind of what we see in the next few days because of the fact that Carson Hinsman wasn't out there on day one. I went into Thursday thinking that most likely we were going to see Carson Hinsman with the first team offensive line at that right guard spot. Though, you know, on the offensive line, there really wasn't a clear first team on day one because they had, you know, Josh Simmons and Donovan Jackson with one unit. They had Seth McLaughlin and Josh Fryer with another unit. I don't know that we're going to necessarily get a clear picture in these first few practices of who that first team guy is. But, you know, the way that, you know, Ryan Day is is talked about Carson Hinsman all offseason makes me think, you know, he's very much in the hunt for that spot. I do think Tegra Shabol is a guy who, you know, has a lot of upside at that position. I think you just look at, you know, how powerful of the kind of explosive athlete he is. You know, he if he can put it all together, you'd think maybe he has kind of a most upside of that group at that right guard spot. Just being, you know, kind of a bigger, more powerful body type than a Carson Hinsman. In, in terms of the idea of having, you know, both centers out there, I don't know if that would be a big concern. I think, you know, basically it's just... If Carson Hinsman is that guy, you know, Tegra Shibola or Luke Montgomery, somebody else has got to be ready because if something happens to Seth McLaughlin, then you're going to have to slide Carson Hinsman back over to center. So I, d- I don't think that that would be any reason not to start Carson Hinsman at right guard if you think Carson Hinsman's one of your best five, because you're also kind of in the same position with Tegra to where he might be your next tackle if something happens to Josh Simmons and Josh Fryer. They don't really have very good depth there at tackle. So I think there's a good chance that even if Tegra starts at right guard, he would then be the guy to slide out to tackle if something happened there. And so, you know, the, the reality is, you know, the depth on the offensive line is a little bit suspect, which means the guys who are competing for that starting spot also have to be able to provide depth elsewhere. Good rundown on the battles and something to keep an eye on uh, the rest of camp. 
We got to talk about something. I guess a battle that maybe we wouldn't normally be talking about, and that's the punter spot, because Ohio State has the biggest Australian punter in the world on the roster. Uh, Nick McLarty, he, uh, you guys got your first look at him yesterday at camp uh, in terms of, you know, on the field and whatnot, seven. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have a, a guy that the rest of the internet will appreciate. You know, you always see those guys on other teams and, and, and Ohio State doesn't normally have those guys. We don't have the kicker with, you know, bifocals on or the, or the, the really hefty quarterback or things like that. But this year we might get a little bit of that with the punter. Is he is he going to play? Like what what do we got on him? I think it's definitely possible that he could be the starting punter right away. I mean, they brought him in as a scholarship player for a reason, right? And the way that you know Ryan Day, even when he's been asked about the punter, you know, Nick's usually the one guy he mentions by name, so that kind of tells you something. That I think you know it again. It's, it's kind of his job to win in the sense that you know he does have the biggest leg of that group. I think if he can show consistency over the course of preseason camp, I think they would probably lean toward him being that guy. But a lot of it's going to depend on how he performs over the next few weeks. Because, I mean, this is a guy, literally, Thursday was the first time he's ever practiced with an American football team. He played Australian rules football out in Australia. So, you know, he has a lot of experience with the punting motion. He's been training with Pro Kick Australia, the same program that uh, produced Jesse Murko and Cam Johnston, former Ohio State punter. So, you know, he's he's been trained well to take on this role. And, you know, there's a big difference between being, say, a freshman quarterback and Julian Sane and a freshman punter and Nick McLarty. If you can do it, it's a much quicker ramp up time than it would be as, say, a quarterback or an offensive lineman. So I think, you know, I, I think they kind of want to see him go out there and win the job. But they also brought in Anthony Veneri, who was the starting punter the last two years at Buffalo, because I think they also wanted to have somebody who has been that punter at the FBS level, has that game experience, where if, you know, Nick McLarty, you know, doesn't show the consistency they want to see in preseason camp, that then they'd have another guy they feel like they can rely on based on his experience. I can't tell you how unrealistic my expectations already are for that guy. Like, Michigan gets in for an important play in a punt block, and he just like forearm shivers the guy and then drags four Wolverines to a first down. Like, I'm already dreaming 6'7, 255. Uh, I certainly hope he wins a job. Can't wait to see that. And Dan, thanks for joining us, man. We always feel like we get smarter when you're on, man. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Thanks, buddy. We'll be right yep. back. And we're back. Joined by Ramsey Nasrallah coming in from the East Coast. Did the uh, quick Dan hope to. Are they the same person? Do they just put on like uh, some glasses and a hat? And that's, that's I am really... Don Hope. Hello. Don Hope. Yeah, good to see you, man. We've got some superlatives we want to get into uh, yes, for the season. Good. Because like camp started yesterday. We're here, man. It's, it's countdown time for the opener. Akron will be here soon. And put a list of these together. I wanted to go around the, around the room here and see what you guys think. And the first one up is going to be offensive MVP. And, you know, we could just take turns, like, you know, answering these in whatever order we want. But who do you guys have for your offensive MVP once the dust is settled this season? I've got Travion Henderson because senior running backs at Ohio State have a legacy of doing this. We just don't get them that often. You don't get a guy that's uh, going to last all four years and then be just so committed and on a mission that he's managing load management with a guy that for which there's no drop off. So I've got him number one. I did a backup for all of these. I've got Will Howard number two, because if he shows up and can orchestrate that offense, then he's going to get the credit for it. Interesting. I don't know if I got Will Howard on my, my depth chart there, but uh, I went, can I go Chip Kelly? Can I go Chip Kelly as my yeah. Own MVP? Yeah. Of course. Edge, I like I, and honestly, I just, I just think that it's being talked about so much about how Kelly's arrival helps Day do all this other stuff, but I think it also helps the offense be better because you've got one guy that's just eating, drinking, sleeping, running the offense, right? I mean, he's really not even recruiting, right? All he's doing is not going to be stubborn and hopefully help a run game that last year was just atrocious. I mean, 4.3 yards a carry, the worst since 2004. I think he's got an ability to not just try to prove, you know, he's not going to just try to prove a point sometimes. And I also think that he's going to be able to hide weaknesses uh, in a way that's going to be very important and, you know, utilize the, the quarterback run. And yeah, I think Chip Kelly is one of the most important, um, you know, pieces of this offense, like by a mile. And I don't think it's getting enough run. Can I tell you what keeps me up at night about Chip Kelly? Proven play caller, offensive genius is the same thing that, that scares me about Ohio State's defense. The defensive coordinator come in, he was amazing, Jim Knowles at 
taking something and turning it into something special. And we're three years in and we're still talking about the jack position. And we're still talking about instrumentation that was created for a program that gets three-star talent and trying to make it work at Ohio State where three stars you have to like compare to Nick Mangold. You have to talk about Malcolm Jenkins. Like, oh, three-star at Ohio State's different. It was like three stars at Oklahoma State. And look at what Chip Kelly had well, in I the last make sure, few years. Are, are, you, are you dumping on Jim Knowles? I want to make sure I understand this correctly. I'm saying that Jim Knowles has not been... Like, I think he's, he's been he's, great. He has been great compared. He also had you know very low bar to clear, but like you have Ohio State players, you can you can run in a lot more aggressive Ohio State defense where you're not like Ben, don't break, be super conservative, or get five touchdowns that are eighty yards or longer against Michigan. They haven't found like the way to do both. Well, you saw we that saw overcorrection it. last year because of those big plays, yeah. right? Job right. one was eliminating those. Now I think you've got Caleb Downs on the back. Like you've, I think it is going to yeah. breathe a little I bit more. I think it's going to be it. better this year, but the last few years, in his first few years, you had to tell him, like, you have Ohio State players now. And if you look at what Chip oh, Kelly's man. had at UCLA, <laughs> he had he, – Chip Kelly was, was not playing with his late-stage Oregon players. He was like, why were they running the ball and running it so effectively? They couldn't throw the ball. Yeah. After DTR left, they, they couldn't like they had no receivers. So now he's got a full complement of like NFL ready talent. And I hope that he doesn't come in and be like, well, we're going to make the Jack position work, whatever the euphemism is going to be for, for uh, the offense and realize like, all right, I'm, I'm back at late stage Oregon. I've got all the pieces I need and I don't have to be like swinging from one end of the thermostat to the other. That's that's what keeps me up at night. Now, could he prove me wrong very quickly? Of course he could. But uh, if you look in hindsight with Jim Knowles, it's like you have to tell him. Hey, you're in a major league team now. You can use, you can call a major league defense. Uh, I can I can buy some of that Chip Kelly stuff. Um, but and in terms of keeping you up at night, but we might have to do a whole separate show on my defense of Jim Knowles because like he's come in and crushed it. He's exceeded expectations. They've been massive improvement in year one. Another big step in year two. If this season turns out like we think, like we're really like, oh man, he's you know we're we're nitpicking. It feels like you know he's he's killed it here. Like he's he's going to have like they had a top five defense last year, comfortably a top five defense, top uh, three in several categories. We're not none of us are baby boomers, but I care about one game. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there, there's other reasons for that. That it's probably beyond Knowles, and and you know the first year didn't of maybe have the guys, didn't have the horses. Um, my offensive MVP. I'm glad you guys asked. Is uh. I'm going to go on a limb, man. I'm going to, you know, and I can be talked off. This is not a hill I'm going to die on, but I'm going to say Jeremiah Smith. And that's how drunk on the Kool-Aid I am right now, because was Claret the offensive MVP of the O2 team? You touched the ball so much more as a running. I'm, I'm as bullish on Jeremiah Smith as you are. I thought I was until you just said that, but I just think the position he plays, it's impossible for him to be the, yeah, you know, by that. The, the, the MVP of the 2002 team was Michael Jenkins, a senior. Who saved them at Purdue, Offensive. saved them at Champaign, okay. saved them on 4th and 13 in Tempe. That's tough. That's a good argument, too, because you can, make a, strong, you can make a case for Jenkins. I'm not ruling it out, but you could, you could literally, literally have an hour debate whether it was Jenkins or Claret on that team. So, as long as you don't say Krenzel, I'm good. Yeah. So, all right. You're right, maybe Maybe a good point about not getting the ball enough. Who do you guys have for your defensive MVP this season? I like Caleb Downs. I mean, I think he's the best, you know, he's going to prove to be the best safety in college football, and I think he just is going to – Kind of what you said, Ramsey, that you were worried about a little, or what your, you know, one of your knocks on on Knowles was. I just think when you have that on the back line, it just should give you so much more confidence to do some other things and, and maybe do a little bit more dictating instead of just having better players in the other team and and being in base if if that's something that you're, you know, bothered by or whatever. But yeah, I just I'm 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 on all in on uh, yeah Downs being you know potentially the best defensive player in college football this year. It's a great pick. I did, you know, one and two. I my my backup, my runner up was Caleb Downs, for for all the reasons you just said. But I think about the last six games of the Ohio State season, including the one that we never want to talk about again, the Cotton Bowl. The best player on the field on the defense six games in a row was Jack Sawyer. Yeah. When he figured it out, when he figured out how to get out of a stance, and figured out how to just make scholarship guys like foolish. There was no one better, and once he once he solved the puzzle. I don't think it's going to be like he's going to have to go through six games this year and the, uh, the light will come on again. I think he's entering the season as the ringleader who brought everyone back. He was the, he was the beginning of everyone saying, yeah, we got to come back. We got to run it back. I think he's going to have like an elite year. He might be the team MVP when it's all said and done because Ohio State is going to not have to score 50 points. It's not going to be like the 2021 team winning games 48, 45 you know, in talent games. They don't have to do as well as they have under Day's best offenses in order to be successful this year. 
Yeah. That's not a not that's that's Jim Knowles like kind of sort of side compliment. And it's because of guys like Jack Sawyer. I am uh, I'm with you. Sawyer was my pick there as well. I love the story, the hometown story, and I agree hundred percent that you know it's not gonna it's not gonna be something that's a click. It's just, he's gonna he's already clicked, man. He's ready to yeah. rock. He's probably he gonna have a season with a ton of confidence and that that confidence is so big, so underrated. If they uh, get I'll, to where, just quick, if they get yep. to where they want to go and you talk about team MVP, Ramsey, I would definitely say that because of how he, you know, we talked about it last week, Jason, like the way he rallied, he was the first guy, right? And then kind of started the dominoes there, bringing all these people back to where we're even having this conversation right now, feeling like this is a national title worthy team. It's not if those eight guys or whatever it was don't, don't come back. And he, he pretty much kicked all that off. Sawyer was definitely number two for me. Uh, so yeah, great, you know. I think we're all expecting a big, big season out of him. Real quick on these next two offensive and defensive breakthrough players, guys that maybe are flying a little bit under the radar, but uh, you know are going to come out this season and show some people. I have Brandon Innes on offense. I think he's going to step into the Xavier Johnson role, catch passes, but they'll also sort of want to do those things where they run him into the backfield and, and maybe just get the ball in his hands before he gets to scrimmage. And for defense, for doing them both at the same time, I have Calvin Simpson Hunt. I uh, just love those spell guys. They're not going to play starters 12, 12 games in a row. He's going to be the first guy off the bench at that other corner, at that field corner. Um, and I think they're going to try to pick on him and people are going to eat shit <laughs> because he's, he's, there's no, there's very little drop off there. I yeah, I, that, I like yeah. that. Uh, that's a really good, that's a good under the radar pick there for sure. Jason, what do you got? We won't make it go last on this. Um, I'm going to take Carnell Tate for very similar reasons. That under the radar. He's well, like, like, I mean, you look at his numbers last year. He didn't have to, you know, it's breakthrough. Yeah. And it's not like yeah. he had like a monster season. What do you have? 300 yards last year. So I'm going to take right. him. I think he's going to have be a, a really big part of the offense. And, you know, that may not be news to some people, but, but I do like that. And I'm going to take Jermaine Matthews for a very similar reason. And he's another guy that the people that know Ohio state know the guy can play, but like, we're talking about breaking through and the other fans going like, holy shit, this guy's really good. And, and that's kind of where my mind went with these two. Yeah. Simpson yeah. Hunt and before you go, Chris, like real mm-hmm. quick trivia: Simpson Hunt and uh, um, Jermaine Matthews Jr. Can you name the two backup corners two years ago at Ohio State? Mm-hmm. Like who were they bringing in after Denzel Burke? And you can't even remember who the other one was. Sounds like you're trying to credit uh, Jim Knowles. I'm, t- I'm crediting Ohio State recruiting, <laughs> and I'm, I'm also diminishing our COVID changeover from Jeff Halfley to whatever the hell it was after that. That was tough, man. That was a tough era. <laughs> Lousy. Why can't we stop anyone? <laughs> Not something we normally say here, but uh, got to, anyway, got to there's no answer to the trivia question. It was more rhetorical trivia. Yeah, yeah. Chris, who you got, man? Yeah, so on offensive breakthrough, like you said, it depends on how you want to look at it versus what they did last year. But I, I just I think people – I'm all in on Jeremiah Smith, but I think people are sleeping big on Carnell Tate. You're hearing about Egbuka and you're hearing about Smith. Carnell Tate is a beast in his own right. I mean, he is – you know, they talk about his route running and everything that he can do. I I don't know. I'm a big fan of that guy. What I would say, I don't want to make Ramsey cringe, and it's not my pick, but I'll tell you what, I think knowing that Howard can't really throw it down the field with any accuracy, you're going to see a lot of stuff 15 yards and in. I wouldn't be surprised if G. Scott Jr. uh, impresses us a little bit this year with his ability to catch the ball. Um, remember, this was a receiver that put on weight. I know we don't like some certain things in Michigan. Like I'm, I'm not debating any of that because it's not debatable. I just, I just think this dude's got some hands, and I think in this offense with this quarterback I, or these quarterbacks, I would not be surprised if uh, Scott Jr. has a better year than a lot of people are thinking about. I love that pick, man. Um, Very bold, man. That's what we want here. Very bold. This wasn't my first, but yeah, I just, I don't know. Keep an eye, right? Makes I, sense. I don't think- I don't think you're wrong, man. Be some, you know, some world beater. Defensively, he played a little bit last year, but again, a guy that people aren't talking about that's penciled in as a starter. I feel like Cody Simon's going to be a really solid yeah, player. With him. Do exactly what they need to do in the middle of the field. He doesn't have to do too much because of everything around him. Just see ball, hit ball kind of thing. Um, especially if they're going to have Sonny at the will. You think about you know coverage out of the backfield and that type of stuff. You'd probably be able to shield Simon from a lot of that stuff and just let him, you know, just like I said, see ball, hit ball. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Cody, you look up at the end of the year and Simon, as a middle linebacker should, but is, you know, top two in tackles on this team. It's his moment. It's a great pick. Yeah, and they 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 rave about his leadership, man. I guess he's like yeah. you know yeah. one of the dudes he's there. Just, they love the guy. Fan favorite on the team, and I'll lead this off. And I'm gonna go with Quinshawn Judkins because I think he's gonna get a lot of gritty, gritty uh, first downs the team needs. He's gonna probably score some touchdowns that fans are absolutely gonna love. He's got the personality. You know, he's kind of the new guy at school, so he's got that whole thing going for him too. So I'm in the Quinshawn camp for the uh, fan favorite for this season. Who you got, Ramsey? 
this this goes right into my weakness, which the last three years allowing Ohio State special teams to be in the condition that they were and being like, you know, hope is a strategy. Maybe they'll get better the next game. And they were just consistently the worst we've ever seen. My Aaron Craft fan favorite is Lorenzo Styles Jr., who this is his last shot. I don't think people realize that. He played enough at Ohio State and at Notre Dame that he, he, he runs out of years. We're, we're getting past the whole COVID extra year where it feels like guys are around forever. He's going to be returning kicks, I think. And for guys our age, we remember Lorenzo Styles Sr. And to have someone back there that's going to do more than just fair catch behind you know a, a unit that's getting holding penalties on designed fair catches somehow. We're going to have Bronx cheers that turn into legitimate cheers when you start to see an athlete like him flip the field on a punt, something we haven't seen since before the pandemic. Yes, yes. Definitely, definitely a definitely a um off the radar pick for sure. I think I mean look, it, crowds are going to gasp every time Jeremiah Smith does anything, so I think he's going to be the fan favorite just because he's going to do things a freshman wide receiver hasn't probably hasn't done at Ohio State, but if you take him out of the equation because of the hype and everything and like I said, people are going to be watch, you know, just watching everything he does. I think this is going to be a really nice bounce I say bounce back, and I think I think I mean that like a bounce back year for Travion Henderson, where I think the fa- some fans have been down on him, maybe thinking not durable, not tough, that kind of stuff. But I think in this offense, with him not touching the ball probably as much with with Judkins and being able to get out and sp- you know they'll be able to play to his strengths that much more, um, and just everything he's talked about with how he's kind of you know just mental health struggles and some of those other things. I think he's an easy guy to rally around, and I, I'm I'm you know assuming he stays healthy, he's going to put up a lot of. Big Big numbers and a lot of big plays like long runs and things like that that are sexy and that you remember about a memorable season. Um, so I, I think uh, I think Travion, if if we're not saying if we're saying Jeremiah is maybe out, of, you know, not eligible for this. So we got Henderson, Judkins, and Lorenzo Styles Jr. for a fan favorite, best freshman this season. Who's it going to be with the qualifier? We can't name the guy that we're all going to name if we can name the guy. So no Jeremiah Smith, but other than Jeremiah Smith. Who is your uh, top freshman on this year's team in terms of what they're going to contribute? Chris? I like James Peoples. I like James Peoples out of the background. I should have let you go first. I'm mad. That's my answer, too. Is that your answer? We're We're unanimous. He's going to play a ton. It's a long season. Long season. And even in those first six games, when you're just talking about, you know, like first five games or whatever, it's going to be a lot of reserves in there playing. And you're going to want to keep, I mean, Day keeps talking about it, right? You're going to want to keep your your guys fresh over this long season. So, yeah, I, I really like what – I like Peebles' tape coming out of high school, and, I, and I've really liked – you know, he, he looked good in the, you know, in the spring. And, yeah, I won't be surprised if, if uh, he's someone that uh, makes, makes a mark this year and has the best numbers as a freshman. Excluding the segment. Party, though, the punter. I mean, you, you could be talking about a punter right off the rip. I thought Tri- someone was going to bring him up for fan favor, especially when Ramsey started his uh, whole thing on the special <laughs> teams play. I'm like, we've got a six, seven, two hundred fifty five pound punter. Let's make him the favorite. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm here for that. So James Peoples is destined to have a great season. I don't overall. think it's close. If you, if it probably has the worst odds. If you take the J- Jeremiah Smith out of it, like the next one is. I mean, we both, well, all three of us, were like, it's James Peoples. Yeah, yeah, good call. Uh, we know we're right because we all agree, and it's it's got to be flawless uh, logic behind that. Let's talk about the schedule and the season. I'm going to start with the easiest game, and again, we're going to have to qualify. I can't name Akron because Akron is absolute dog shit this season, and that will far be the easiest game on the schedule. I actually am going to go Western Michigan, and this is me trying to figure out if it's Western Michigan or Marshall that is the worst team on the schedule. I think Marshall's got a better team. Chris, where are you at? Um, I think Marshall is the easiest game. I think what that might be coming off a of bye week. I was looking at the SP plus. They're both they're like one hundred three and one hundred six in the SP plus. But Marshall only has like forty six percent of their production back. Western Michigan's like seventy three percent of their production back on both sides of the ball. So just play in the numbers and then throw a bye week in there on top of it. Um, I'll take uh, I'll take Marshall as the easiest. Bye week's huge. Good an- good answer. The bye week. No, no, just the fact that he recognized that would be uh, contributing oh, to Marshall. Yeah. Being, yeah, coming off a of bye, everyone's going to be healthy, ready to play again. Yeah, I think Ohio State's going to thrive in the bye week. I went with uh, with Purdue because it's in early November. It's a Big Ten game. They're going to suck. But also, you'll start to see CFP uh, rankings come out, and we'll get whipped up, not about getting into the top four, but it's the top 12, and it'll start to do projections on who's going to play whom in the beginning with you know, margins for error. And I think you'll start to see some style points, plus Ohio State hitting a cruising altitude and figuring out who they are and who they want to portray that they are. 
And who better to humiliate than a team that never wins in Ohio Stadium, the Purdue Boilermakers? I love that answer, man. I do. I think that's 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 a great point about the CFP style points and, and that stuff coming into play. And a, a team that probably will be hitting uh, peak gear by then. Toughest game. And I know we might diverge here. Um, I'll start us off, man. I think the toughest game is at Oregon. Uh, I think it's by far the toughest game on the schedule. I think that they have a hell of a coach. Uh, Dan Lanning is awesome. I think they've got a stacked roster. I think they have a style of football that's going to be fun. And tickets at 400 bucks a pop, that's going to be one of the biggest games in Allison in a long, long, long time, at least in terms of non-conference. So I think the atmosphere is going to be insane out there. I think that will be um, – I mean – I'm kind of mentally preparing it like, hey, high state might, you know, maybe has a chance to lose that game. Like maybe keep keep my perspective. There's 12 teams going to make the field. Just got to win the rest. But uh, that's where I am for toughest and would love to hear what you guys have to say. Go ahead, Ramsey. I think we know where you're at. It's Michigan. It's the, the one with the mental block. It doesn't matter who's suiting up. All of the juice is on that side of the rivalry. Um, I think Ohio State has no sort of apprehension or demons even though a lot of the guys on the team were there when they lost to Oregon that was because of the defense is because of ghosts that have left the building I think they'll have no problem getting up for it and they'll have no sort of don't screw up like you know what, what I guess McCord was yelling at the team in the tunnel on the way out to Ann Arbor like can't make any mistakes that's not going to happen it's going to be like let's go out and send them home sad and by the way Brian Day has won big games Dan Lanning has not not, not at Oregon he he lost to Washington twice last year. Um, they were wiping the floor with whomever else. But, but he murdered Prime. we got to give him a little something for that, right? <laughs> R- rhetorically murdered him, then went out and murdered him on the turf. Well, I mean, like that I was said, a great Saturday. he doesn't win big games against good teams. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty sweet, yeah. Yeah, I think so. toughest game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously pick your poison. I, I went Oregon. I do think it's it's more of a matchup game. Totally agree on the mental block and all that. I, I think at home this year, I think – Part of the reason Michigan's won a handful of games isn't just being in Ryan Day's head or that other stuff. It's that Michigan was actually really, really good. And I don't think they're really, really going to be really, really good this year. I think they're just going to be good. So, yeah, I'll, I'll take uh, I'll take Oregon as the toughest game. And, and I tossed the most important game up. We're going to talk about that next. For me, that's Michigan. Now, because that that could be Ryan Day's job. I mean, we're done here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that, yeah. we're probably all on the same page. Yeah, there's there, no other that, answer they, for most important. There's but no Chris, I'm other. with you on, on the sense that uh, that I, you know, last season, if you asked me in August about if I was worried about the Michigan game, I'd say, yeah, they're gonna have a good team. It should be a tough game. It's in Ann Arbor. This, I'm just not as worried as I, I was last year. Not to say I'm as comfortable as like when you know Tress was dog stomping like some really really bad Michigan teams or Urban was smacking bad teams. Like I'm not there where you just like, yeah, okay, I'll go watch right. Rich Rod get murdered on Saturday. But like, you know, it's just they're not as good, and and, and I feel like there's. If Ohio State loses that game this year to Michigan after my going into the th- season thinking that Michigan's not as good as they have been, I might have to like take his pause from being a fan for a little bit because that's probably going to hit me, man, pretty hard because it'll be four in a row, <laughs> probably by far their worst team of the four, um, and, and Ohio State's best team, and, and the loss coming that late in the season, so uh, tough one there. Trap game. What do you guys? You know, I'm, I looked it over. I don't know that I see a ton of trap games. I want to say Nebraska could be a trap game because it's sandwiched between Oregon and Penn State, and they're probably going to be a little better. But Ohio State's got a week off before they have to play that game. Like, they could play Oregon, come home, chill out for a week, heal up, and then they get Nebraska in the shoe. I don't know if I see a true trap on there. Where, where are you guys at on that question? I would uh, – I'll go first, Ramsey. I, I, um, if I had to pick one, I would say Iowa. It's the week before Oregon. Um, Iowa's got – about all of their defense back, which is a really good defense. I'm just, I'm still, you know, Dan said it earlier in the show. I think we're all kind of a little skittish on Will Howard, maybe to varying degrees, but that's just one of those games I could see, you know, where you kind of have to potentially grind it out. You're looking at, you know, you're going to Oregon next week. Do you kind of waltz into that one, taking yourselves a little bit for granted and end up, you know, um, Winning up, you know, closer than be expected. A, a trap game doesn't mean upset. That's not an upset game. That's just a game you better, right. you know, pay attention to, or it could come back and bite you in the butt. And I think as I look at the schedule, I was the only one that really jumps out at me. Good call. That, that was my runner up, but for all the reasons you listed, I have Nebraska um, just because I think that uh, it, it's, it's a recruiting game and rule needs to demonstrate like you're not coming to a rebuild. You're coming to. You're coming to play fun brand of football that hangs with the bullies of the conference. 
And so I don't think you're going to get like the conventional, this is what they do. You're going to get like a whole sack of hammers, everything that you've never heard of before. They're going to be saving up, run up once that season and, and try to get it done. It's, it's part of the reason uh, world debut. We're going to be doing the dub gate that, that day. Ooh, the dub gates undefeated. News. Yeah. Dub gates never lost. <laughs> and it had every reason to lose in years like 2011. <laughs> and they, yeah. they beat a top 10 Wisconsin <laughs> team. Like we're, we're, we're pulling out secret weapons for, for that. So, I had Nebraska, both corn teams, Nebraska and Iowa. I think, you know, Iowa lost their best player to the draft. Is it Cooper DeGene or DeJean? I don't know how they say it in Iowa. But they also lost their worst coach. They sure did. (laughs) So the yin and the yang of Iowa coming back into focus, right? Yeah. Well, you have to actually score points to beat them now. That's That's true. That's true. That's a good pick, man. Nebraska, they're going to have Dylan Riola, man. That'll be an energy game. Uh, Speaking of energy game. What game on the schedule are you looking forward to? By the end of the year, you'll say, man, that was the, fu- the most fun game. I mean, it may not seem fun at the time. Maybe it's uh, like Notre Dame was kind of fun afterwards last year, but wasn't fun for like 95% of the game. So maybe one of those where we're looking back and like that game was fun. Uh, where are you guys at with that? I love a wideout. And as an Ohio State fan, they have a, they have a better winning percentage in wideouts than Penn State does. And Penn State holds wideouts. Uh, I look forward to that. I think it looks good on television. I like how they generally end when Ohio State's lost <laughs> since the invention in 2005. It kind of gifted the game away. I don't think this is the kind of Ohio State team that gifts a game, game away. Also, I can't name a single Penn State wide receiver outside of Julian Fleming who would not be starting on this year's Ohio State team. He might not even start there is what I'm hearing, too. Like, he might oh, really? have, a, have a bad receiver. <laughs> Sorry, Julian. Man, I want him to do well. I just want him, you know, not, a, not, not that day. Me too. Chris, what about you? What's the, what's the most fun game we're going to look back yeah, on? Yeah, well, from a fan perspective, I don't go to a lot of games, but knowing we're, we're going to Wrigley and, you know, for, for the Northwestern game, I think that will be, you know, that will be a fun experience kind of thing. But if we're talking about fun game, like, you know, what, what's actually going on on the field, um, I, I think it's going to be Michigan. Your stomach's going to be a knots leading up to it, and I'm expecting the outcome that, you know, that that, uh, that my soul wants and needs and it's you know when you think about how the season should progress to that point with probably no more than one loss it's going to mean a shit ton besides just beating michigan um so yeah i think i'm 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 hoping that that's going to turn out to be the most fun yeah good call good call i was going to say maybe something else but uh you're right man the the release of some emotions if that game comes in with the result we all expect uh will will be will be really fun uh and it'll be something to look back on too and I'm sure somebody at the head of the program, if he does get it done, will probably look back on that game as a special one as well. Uh, Best road trip? I feel like it's a coin toss, depending on how much time in your life you've spent on the West Coast or Chicago. Because one's at Wrigley in Chicago in November, which, you know, better times to go to Chicago than November, if I'm being honest. And the other one's earlier in the season uh, in Oregon. And uh, a lot of fun stuff to do out there as well. You guys have to pick one of those games to travel to and only one. Which one are you picking? I picked Wrigley. So Chris is the most fun game. Uh, I, I had that. And then the next question was road trip. Oh, well, I have to switch it now because the, the Wrigleyville that, that day, that weekend is just going to be silly. Um, in a good way. Cause I, it's going to be a lot of red and a little bit of purple. Yeah. Yeah. I think most fun would be Wrigley, but most, interesting yeah would would be going to you know be going yeah. to Oregon if you're talking about like the football but if you're talking everything the macro around it then yeah it's it's Wrigley for me there's yeah. nothing around there's nothing around Eugene Oregon no and you know with all of us there we should probably start thinking about like having a Friday gathering of some sort maybe in Wrigley if it makes sense absolutely um, we're I know we dropping probably... all kinds of bombs in here man yeah right you yeah. know news breaks you got to tune in really important questions now what's Ohio State's regular season one loss record at the end 11 and 1. I got 12 and 0 for the seventh year in a row. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I don't know one of you guys are going to be right, and I don't know which one of you it's going to be because I, I could see them dropping that game to Oregon. And I could also easily see them going 12 and 0. I'm going to go 12 and 0 to keep good vibes alive. And I'm going to speak that into existence, the Oregon debacle. So. I'm going to say 12 and 0, and that answers our next question. Chris, I assume your Oregon's the loss you're mentioning when you say 11 and 1. You're not talking about Michigan or anything, are you? No, 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 definitely not talking about Michigan. I assume Oregon. I mean, it's a toss up. It's a toss up game. I just, I, I think of my concerns on the right side of the line and a quarterback. It's like, can they win 12 in a row with that, even with this defense? I just, you know, in a game that could maybe be a shootout by, you know, by those standards, that might be one where if you, you know, get down early and you're trying to keep up. A little bit that um you know just concerns me a little bit with uh 
the quarterback's really inability to to stretch the field. Does it comfort you? And, and I'm asking myself this question a little bit too, because I just realized that like Michigan bullied the hell out of Washington last year. And you watch the Washington Oregon games, you're like those are two really good teams. Then you watch Michigan just go bully the shit out of Washington. So does that does that help at all in the head? To think, oh, okay, I, maybe these uh, teams are because like, the last time Ohio State played Oregon, they bullied the hell out of yeah, them. I remember our yeah. beat guys were down there and they were talking about at Media Day seeing the Alabama players in the Sugar Bowl Media Day. I'm like, these guys are massive. And then mm-hmm. the next week, seeing the Oregon guys, you're like, they're tiny. Like they knew right away Ohio State was going to win that game. I wonder how much of that's still out there and if that helps. I'm not expecting a loss necessarily. I just, I just think it's hard to win 12 in a row kind of thing. I almost think maybe that could, I don't want to say it'd be a good thing, but um, it's hard to win 16 or whatever it's going to take. Like, you know, if, if you go completely undefeated uh, in this day and age, I just, I have a lot of respect for Lanning and uh, yeah, I'm not penciling in an L per se. I just think, uh, like I said, 12 and 0 is really hard to do. Winning the last game is more important than if you lost, you know, one of the first 11. They won 10 in a row in 21. They won 11 in a row each of the last two years. I think they can win 12 in a row. Hope so, man. What the really, really last and important question is, what's the outcome of the final game that uh, they play this season? I've got uh, Ohio State 35, Georgia 24. In, 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 in the Music City Bowl. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Georgia, Georgia, is Georgia going to have eligible players for that game or at this pace? <laughs> They're just going to take an Uber to the stadium. They can't drive on their own. Yeah, you start to see some cracks in the armor there. I don't know. I, I'm uh, I'm not as bullish on Georgia this they're year. I'm taking they're, that. Just, they're bad outside. They're, they're bad off the field. I'll take Ohio State over Texas. And you guys are both picking natties, right? I am. That's safe to assume. Like, because I mean, some of these games can be there's gonna be some banger semifinal games this year too. Like, I think this is gonna be awesome. Ohio State over people, Georgia. We we talked about last year being the last college football season ever as NIL is kind of ramping up and this past off season ramped up and now we have a 12 team playoff and like, Oh, you're destroying everything that we used to know and love. Well, I mean, we all watch bowl games. And if you talk about December bowl games, there are more people watching than in the city where they're being held. There's, yeah. we're watching for the, the pop tart, the Duke's Mayo jar, the Mayo dump. Like what are we losing here? Nothing. We're getting, we're getting like four weeks of like incredible hype and tournament and like build up. I couldn't be more excited about it. I hope my team's in, you know, in it till the very end. But even if it's not, like, I'm gonna watch it. It's yeah. gonna be great. I'm with you, man. I cannot wait. I've always been a proponent of expansion, and like, you know how those ranking shows like rile everyone up on Tuesday night. Everyone's pissed off on Tuesday and arguing about who beat only because how- we have to cover it. Well, and how <laughs> bad they beat him. But the whole internet gets mad at that show, and that's why the show is perfect because it makes everyone mad. Yeah. Right. Um, now this year we're gonna have like eight other fan bases talking shit. You know, there's going to be like way bigger. It's not going to be like four teams, like, or five teams. There'll be like, you know, 12, 13, 14 teams chirping each other every Tuesday and calling Damn. out their coaches and how they barely squeak by someone on the road. And like, I can't wait for that. That's what makes us. We're going to have people with Liberty handles in the 11 Warriors forum. Like, yeah, Liberty. it's coming, man. It's <laughs> what are we coming. Doing? I cannot wait. Um, <laughs> that was fun, man. We'll have to do some, we'll have to come back at the end of the season and see how well we did. We, you know, we do these on the website all the time and we're usually, uh, wrong, spectacularly wrong quite a bit, but, uh, I feel like we gave good answers tonight. So I'm going to, I'm going to cheer for how if this we turns can predict out. the future. We wouldn't be doing this shit. We'd be in Vegas posting up and betting on games that hadn't happened yet. That's right. We're going to talk about our dude, Yusuf, Gitch, the Turkish 51 year old dad who brought home a silver medal at the Olympics in Paris for shooting. And I'm sure most people have probably seen this human by now, but he looks like a regular dude that just got off his couch and went to the Olympics. And he's playing a sport you probably don't have to put a lot of cardio, I'm guessing. I don't think that shooting has cardio at all. What is shooting practice like? They don't like hit a treadmill. They're just like, just go out there and shoot, right? Yeah. And his competitors have like RoboCop glasses that are like will blur and, you know, and emphasize one eye and like custom uh earpieces for sound protection and really cool guns and he's just out there with like some readers on his his pistol up here like his hand in his pocket just like laying down lead a legend uh, i love it man he's an internet legend and, and the, the one thing i love about it too is that it's one of the cool things that the whole world can kind of agree on they're probably countries that hate each other we'll go we'll pakistan india for example but there are people in India and Pakistan are like that's funny as shit, man. That guy, that guy is shooting like like a dad up there. So I love that aspect of it that everyone could come together. But for you guys, 
if you could quit your job and were funded and had 10 hours a day to practice pistol, do you think you could make the Olympics by the time you died? No. <laughs> 10 hours not. a day? <clears throat> to just no. practice. Man, I, I, you don't I've need written to, you about don't need physical. <laughs> every week for 27 years, I'm still not very good at it. <laughs> well, that's different. You got to have a frame and the, t- the, you know, the body. This you can, any of us can do. Like, look at this guy. Oh, my God. I, th- I got more faith in both of you probably than you do. I think you guys can do it, man. I really you know, there, do. There was a Dennis Quaid movie that I'm not remembering the name of because I wasn't prepared for the conversation. But he he's like throwing the ball. He ends up making the double raise like I said it actually happened. And it was just some dad who went and did it. And I love that kind of stuff. And I would love for – like this this guy, Yusuf, is great. I want to see it in other sports too. I want someone to show up you know, in the, in the Olympic Natatorium in like actual swim trunks – from like Turkmenistan, but like, who is this guy? And he gets in and just starts lapping people. Like, oh yeah, Gary, he just, he loves to swim. <laughs> he made the Olympic team and he's here. Or you, like a gymnast that's like over four foot nine. Like, oh, they look huge. And then they're just killing in all these things. Like, I love the, like, the unexpected, the sort of, you know, even rookie of the year, that, that movie about the, the six year old or whatever, however old that little kid was that made the Cubs. Give me stories like Yusuf all the time because everyone shows up on nutritional programs with eight handlers and, all this training, it's all geared towards this event. I just want like, you know, Larry to get off his couch and be like, you know what, I can do this and then just dominate. <laughs> I love where you went with that too, because I think they they should do like even if we don't have a common person dominating, maybe we like in, in swimming or other things, you just like have one lane reserved for like a fan boat. And it's just some guy like you mentioned from some <laughs> random great. country. And he's like, they're showing like the Ledecky graphic, but it's mm-hmm. actually like way, way bigger. And he's like, yeah. he's coughing up water. And he's actually getting tired halfway through the lap. And he's like waving his hands like, I'm done. Like, I want to see like a, a fan. I put him out there on the pommel horse. Yeah, like, man. You know, I just broke my leg. You know, like weight, weightlifting, someone just shows up in jean shorts. Like, this, this guy's like, <laughs> and then just like throws up a thousand pounds. <laughs> oh, it's sensational. Oh, yeah, it's the local strongman. Yeah, I love that stuff too, man. And, and But I do, I, I have faith that you guys can get it done. And, and, and the weird thing is that like, there's only a few sports. There's a small window for like regular guys like us to put in a ton of time, like 10,000 hours of practice, whatever that is. Pistol, rifle, uh, curling. I'm trying to think if there are any others. Like, I know even like pole vault, yeah. I think we'd probably like get hurt pole vaulting. So I don't think we could do that. But there's, there's curling, pencil, pistol, like fencing. Probably you have to have some athleticism to do yeah. that. I don't think you can yeah, do that. quick twitch. That's video games, man. Yeah. With your whole body. Right. Beach volleyball, get smoked at that. Speed skating, smoked at that. Yeah, that's even like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you have to almost have a sport where you don't have to do any cardio. For yeah. super, it has to be that kind of sport. Oh my God. And there are so, only so uh, many yes, skeet and whatever the yeah skeet. What about yeah. like equestrian? Like you could learn how to ride really well. Ride just, a horse? Yeah. I don't even know how that's judged. I have no idea. I've never watched it. And no. do you guys, to like, how do you get points in that? I don't know, but I saw someone won a medal and they took a selfie with the horse and the horse smiled. Just that's really, amazing. <laughs> that's great. That's, I mean, that's a living moment. I wonder that's if the horses just... have the same conversation. Like, how did he get to the equestrian in the Olympics? <laughs> right. Like, you see like, how out of shape. Look at him. And we're like, they're all horses. Like, we can't tell. All right, some some quick uh, quick bits to touch on before we get out of here this week. Michigan's on notice, allegedly. Uh, big news on Monday from the Wolverine.com, the On3 Michigan affiliate, uh, said the NCAA is prepared to issue a notice of allegations for the Connor Stallion stuff. And, it, and we're all like, filing, let's do this. Uh, they, the report said they expect Michigan to be hit with a level one violation, and the NCAA could seek a postseason ban of one or two years. Per the report, the wins and the natty are not expected to be vacated. But again, that postseason ban of one or two years is pretty significant. Of course, the other insiders at in Michigan are putting out contrary stories and saying, you know, what they have is not right and this and that. And, you know, one of my favorite things is to watch like the team's insiders like argue with each other on the Internet. Like you got one guy over here at on three, one guy at 24 seven. They're taking like subtle jabs at each other. I think that's enjoyable. So I like seeing that. But uh, you guys have high hopes for anything big to happen here. I, I think the reports are dubious because that's not the order that news comes out. Notice that we know this is Ohio State fans. The notice of allegations shows up and it's like, here's the stuff you did wrong that we've discovered. You don't talk about the punishment until the school responds. How could you be talking about vacating wins? This is like when sports Brad Brooks was talking about, oh, Ohio State's going to get a TV ban when they, they hadn't got the notice of allegations yet from, from uh, Tatgate. That's not how it works. So if the school has been notified, like, hey, you know, check your mail, it's coming. That's one thing. But the punitive piece, the, the recourse does not happen until next offseason, maybe next season. Like, that's Tatgate began in December of 2010. And the punishment was levied uh, the, like the day before Trestle's birthday, 2011, December 5th. 
Yeah, I know that by heart. That's a year. Yeah. We haven't started yet. And this is so much more complicated than what happened at Ohio State. Yeah. So I think that the ones kind of looking at Chris Ballas from, uh, is he on? I can't, I don't know. What That's the on three. Being in like, there. dude, you're just trying to sell subscriptions with salacious and like appealing to whomever. I think those insiders are right. Yeah, they could be getting a letter, but we don't know anything about it. And we definitely don't know what the punishment is going to be because that does not happen. That's it's not the beginning of the trial. It's the end. Well said. I, yeah, tough to add anything to that because, like, I think you're dead on, Chris. Um, oh, yeah, I think he was pretty much pretty much Mike dropped it. I mean, I hope they drop a bomb on their whole program and give them the death penalty, obviously. But yeah, I don't know that uh, that's, that's happening. And I, I'm not trying to take shots at any, but I, but I feel like maybe that site, that person had some accuracy issues throughout the reporting of the Harbaugh stuff. So Whenever I'm they like, have the subscription sale in the same blurb as the news report, it's kind of like, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Other Grifter. news uh, that's semi-related, uh, Central Michigan's quarterback coach, Jake Costner, is no longer with the program. CMU put out a statement to ESPN and others saying they would not comment on personnel decisions, but Costner is pretty good friends with Connor Stallions uh, from their time together at Michigan. I think Costner spent four years at Michigan. We saw Connor in disguise. Seriously, like, still one of the most surreal stories that, you know, like, how could that get any better? Like, wearing the glasses and the hat and, like, the, the was the goatee fake? Wow. So, uh, you know, you can draw your own conclusions there, but uh, we'll have to wait for some more news to drop. Today on the Big Ten Network is, uh, you know, a day dedicated to the four new members of the conference, Washington, Oregon, UCLA, and USC, who are both in LA. I don't know if people know that, but they're both in LA and they're giving us some great stuff, man. This is honestly like one of the funniest elements of expansion is like when conferences just kind of appropriate the legends like remember like oh bill walton's big 10 now you know like so yeah. anyway tune in later today on on the big network because there's the uh Detlef shrimp big 10 trailblazers episode <laughs> which we've all been dying to see and uh, yeah i just had to laugh i'd never thought i'd see the day we'd see a big 10 trailblazers episode on Detlef shrimp Who, the pre, pre-twitter pre-toilet twitter or pre-current toilet twitter when Oregon was announced, I imagine there were tweets that were like, Big Ten legend, Detlef Shrimp. Like, it's actually happening now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's real. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. Trailblazer. Big Ten legend, that. Tommy Frazier, when Nebraska joined, like, all the Big Ten networks, like, we hear you. We see yeah. it. I we're remember watching, like, a 60 minute feature on uh, Gary Williams in Maryland's 2002 yeah. National Championship run. I was like, well, okay. yeah, we're doing right. that. We're doing that now, huh? Mike that Davis. Not, that was an all Big Ten final. That wasn't all Big Ten. <laughs> Retroactively, all Big Ten, and that's, that's educational, all... though. You know, those could be educational programs on your, you, you know, your new, uh, your new schools that are in the mix. I need the Todd Marinovich Big Ten icons. I yes. need, I need one on Sam Gilbert too. The, the, the OJ Bronco really chase. Is, uh... They're not, they're not touching OJ. That's the one guy. Yeah, I can, no, I can no, no, they won't do that. But yeah, give I me Marinovich. Give me Sam Gilbert, the the real brains behind UCLA's dynasty. Okay, yeah, well, Ten, behind UCLA's dynasty. Big Ten legend Gaston Green. Most most Rose Bowls were all Big Ten. They're like, <laughs> oh, yeah. the Big Ten so has good. won more Rose Bowls than any other conference. I mean, let's right. be real, like by far. It lost more, right? and that wasn't always the case until like a year and a half ago. But you know, Big Ten has won more and lost more than any other. It's uh, like if the Sugar Bowl was like two SEC teams every year. That's what the Rose Bowl is now. Yeah, retroactive. I love that. Last thing for this one, man. Thanks for sticking with us. Is uh, Pole Assassins come out on top, man. I never thought it, those were some words I would say, but uh, Texas special teams coach Jeff Banks married his longtime partner, Danielle Thomas, honeymooned uh, in Barcelona, may still be there, may be coming back soon. Uh, why are we talking about uh, Texas special teams coach and his marriage? Is because Thomas, better known by her stage name, Pole Assassin, which, you know, I don't know what her occupation was. I have a really strong guess what her occupation was based on that name i don't, I don't want to like get in any legal trouble by saying things that aren't necessarily true but I, I i have a hunch what she did for a living and and uh you know in 2021 this coach and his his girlfriend were made national news because a report came out that they had a first of all they had a, a therapy monkey which i didn't know was a thing and right. this therapy monkey bit a child in their neighborhood and the report comes out, he's a Texas coach, and his girlfriend's stage name is Pole Assassin. And the whole internet was like, what is going on? Why do we have, what, did I read that right, Pole Assassin? So congrats to the newlyweds. Tough to do, man. I, I think, personally, if, if I were Pole Assassin adjacent in any news I was reported on, I'd have to walk away and be like, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. You know, my name's out in the headlines next to Pole Assassin now. We can't do this. Um, we're, th- you- we're three cowards that go on the internet by our actual government names. That's right. That's we're just right. jealous. I don't know, man. Like, would you? 
I don't know. I'm trying to think of a better name for that industry. And again, this is an alleged industry. I don't know for a fact that that was a job, but uh, that's, that's anyone, up there. Anyone who's listened this long in the pod, I'm going to give you some some advice, and 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 you can you can own it. Go on Amazon.com and create a gift registry under the name of Pole Assassin, and you're going to get some gifts because someone's going to find it. And be like, I, I got to get I got to get Pole Assassin some some matrimonial you know, presents. They're going to do it. They're not going to. They're not going to vet it. This is the, one of the easiest grift eras in American history. Go cash in. Go be pull assassin on Amazon. That's genius. You know what you could even do? You could leak it yourself, and you could collect it. Like you could run. I know I haven't already done this. You could run the whole operation, man. You could like. Do you guys need anything for the house? Do you need some new plates? Do you need like a you know a, a, a pull assassin a, wants a Roomba? All right, I'll get that. <laughs> <laughs> pull assassin has expensive tastes, but. Uh, that's genius, man. I didn't think of that, but you're right. And, and, and again, that's something you could you could do yourself, man. You could run point on it and collect all the loot. I can't believe this pod's free. Right? We should charge for it. We should, man. There's business device, all kinds of stuff out there. Chris, any uh, any parting thoughts on Pole Assassin and where that ranks in your top 10 no, list of names no, he, that hypothetically would be a stripper? Well. I think if you are going to do that, though, you need some gifts in there that might make sense, like some thigh-high leather boots and then a rumba. Like, you can't just have, you know, those kinds of things or... I don't think people are going to think you're really the pole assassin. I agree, but who do you give the boots to when you get them? You return them for uh, Amazon credit. All right, big brain, big brain. We got some, we got some scammers on there. After that, just get a new blender. We're changing this pod next week. It's just going to be all scams. All right, we're talking about how to how to like swindle people. I think that's a much better angle. Probably would resonate more globally too. If we're, if we're being honest about it. Very right. So hey, had a blast. Thanks for joining us. You know, I think we're on weekly from here on out until the end of the season. So we got some some a few previews ahead of us. I think next week's a deep dive on the offense. The week after is defense. We'll get into the Big Ten, talk some more about those games. But uh, we enjoyed it. We hope you did too. And uh, as always, take care of each other. Be good to each other. Go Bucks.